Goedemorgen allemaal. Uh, ook ik heet jullie nog even welkom namens de Redelijke Commissie. Uh, we gaan met mij over naar het inhoudelijke deel van deze uh, uh, vijfde conference. Ik zag dat er vanochtend al vroeg mensen online waren, dus uh, ik hoop dat jullie echt een hele enthousiaste dag gaan krijgen. We starten het inhoudelijke deel met Pete Brown. Uh, Pete Brown, uh, Engels auteur. Craft and Argument is zijn laatste boek geweest. Uh, hij is bekend van een, een twaalftal boeken. Uh, uh, en hij houdt vooral van het mooie achter het bier, achter ciders, pubs, bacon rolls, fish and chips, zoals hij het zelf zegt. Uh, hij bekijkt uh, de bierwereld uh, zeg maar door zijn bril uh, en uh, is uh, het hoofd van de National British uh, Beer Writers Guild. Um, um, ik hoop dat je een hele interessante sessie voor jullie gaat hebben. Uh, mochten jullie vragen hebben, stel ze in de chat. Ik ben de moderator, ik zal de vragen rechtstreeks aan Piet stellen. Dus I'm not sure, Piet, are you already in? Here I am, yes. Hello. Good morning, Piet. Welcome to our first online but fifth Dutch craft beer conference. Hope It's great to be well. here. Thanks for inviting me. All right. So, uh, um, do you think we can start? Do you want to introduce something yourself? Yeah, that would be great. I'll, uh, I'll start if you're ready for me. All right. Um, so, uh, I guess we're ready. So, please start. Fantastic. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me to your conference uh, and for allowing me to speak about my, my latest book. Um, Craft and Argument is a book that began as a as an attempt to annoy people. Uh, I, I'm as fascinated. I'm, I'm very much a beer lover, uh, but I'm also a lover of words. I, I I write about beer because it unites my two passions, and and I'm fascinated more than any healthy person should be uh, about the, the the endless debate around the definition of craft beer. Um, and and I, I, I am annoyed by it, but absorbed by it at the same time. And so I wanted to take this debate and make it very intellectual and, and, and push it as far as I can before people start going, oh, come on, this is ridiculous now. And, and I wanted to annoy people with my presentation and that didn't happen. Instead, people said, no, you've got to dig into it more. You've got to, you've got to tell us more about it. You've got to write a book about it. So when lockdown hit uh, last year, uh, last March in the UK, I had nothing to do. I had no work. So I decided to write the book. Uh, so I'm going to share with you the, the presentation that, in some ways led to the book uh, and also um, kind of some, now summarizes the book. Um, and, it's, and it's inspired by this idea, is it, is, is it time to leave craft beer behind? Uh, it's after 20 years of there being a global craft beer movement, there's still not a definition of it that satisfies everyone. At the same time, uh, big brewers have perhaps cheapened the term uh, by, uh, by adopting it, by applying it to beers, which perhaps we many people don't perceive as craft, uh, and using cynical marketing to try and make craft beer meaningless. Um, it would be quite healthy for them if craft beer didn't mean anything, then they could use it, it wouldn't be a threat to them. Um, so in order to explore this in a lot of detail, I looked at the history of craft beer as a term. Uh, so I'm going to explore that first, how it came to be, uh, why, it's so why it's so important, and why it can never be defined. Uh, to, to in, a, in a way that we can use it to measure something, in a way that we can use, say, by this definition, this brewery is craft, this brewery isn't. That's never going to happen. It's never going to work. Then I'm, then I'm going to leave craft beer aside for a minute and look at the history of the word craft. Um, and I, I'm, I'm conscious that I'm, I'm doing this to a Dutch-speaking audience. So I'm sure your English is brilliant, uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the meanings of English words, uh, and I'll, I'll try and make that as clear as I can. Uh, and then having learned what we can from craft, come back to beer and see if that leaves us anyway. And then look at this, this shift from craft to independence and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing and how that should maybe, some, some thoughts on how that should maybe uh, be happening. So it's always been, the term craft has always been controversial. Uh, even it's where it came from is, is up for some debate. And this goes back to North America in the early 1980s, late 1970s, early 1980s, when uh, with the liberalization of home brewing legislation, uh, lots of people began brewing in their garages, in their basements, that kind of thing, uh, mainly for their own um, interest, for their own consumption. But some of these brewers turned out to be very good and, and began selling their beers locally. And there were all these different terms. Journalists began writing about the, about the scene and using microbrewery, independent brewery, nano brewery. And um, the term that started to stick was microbrewery, which is, which is one that was still in regular use quite recently. Um, and the problem with microbrewery was at this time, uh, the people doing craft beer were, were interested in traditional techniques, in doing things by hand, uh, in turning away from an increasingly technical and technological future. 
And at the time, there was a lot of talks with, with computers coming in, home computers. They were being referred to as microcomputers, and everyone was talking about microchips. So everyone felt, the brewers felt that microbrewery kind of made, was the opposite of what they wanted to be. It was making it sound futuristic and technological. And so a beer writer uh, called Vince Cotone was, was writing in the Pacific Northwest and said, perhaps a better definition of the brewers who make traditional handmade small batches of beer for local sale and local consumption would be craft beer instead of microbreweries. And this was 1984, um, and, and that's often cited as the first attempt to, to coin the term craft brewing. But as with many things, uh, Michael Jackson, uh, the beer, UK beer writer, did it first. Um, uh, there's several times in my career where I believe I've done something original in beer writing um, for the first time. And usually if you believe that, if you look back in Michael Jackson's work, you find that he did it 30, 40 years ago. It's just a, a truth, a truth of beer writing. And Michael Jackson had a small pocket guide to, to breweries. And in that guide in 1982, he described Timothy Taylor, uh, a, a, a Cascale brewer in Keithley, as a craft brewery down to the last detail. Very small, producing a wide range of all malt beers. Now, Jackson carried on to use craft beer and craft brewing to describe breweries in the US uh, and in Belgium. He never, he was very precise about the words he chose, and he never offered a definition of craft beer, craft beer or craft brewery. He just assumed that people would know what he meant if he used that term. Uh, and he says here, very small, producing a wide range of all malt beers. That's probably the closest he comes to a definition. And, and there's been some speculation that what Jackson was trying to do was find an English language equivalent for the French term artisanal, because uh, even in, in England, with, with a terrible knowledge of French generally, we, we like the idea of artisanal, and we've adopted that word, and it's good, and it's, it, it says craft, it says small production. Uh, and Jackson felt that craft was probably the, the, the closest English equivalent. Um, two years later, 1986, Vince Cotone uh, pursued this further, uh, and he, he came up with this as a, what he offered as a definition. I use the term craft brewery to describe a small brewery using traditional methods and ingredients to produce a handcrafted, uncompromised beer that is marketed locally. I refer to this beer as true beer. So, so the, the, the true beer bit vanished fairly quickly, um, but I think that's quite interesting that in the UK, you know, since the 1970s, we've had this term real ale, and real ale, true beer, they're, they're, they're just interchangeable words. So American craft beer could very easily have been called real ale, and we might have had something in the UK called true beer. But looking at the definition of a craft brewery, uh, if we think small brewery, traditional methods, handcrafted, uncompromised, marketed locally, I mean, to my mind, that is a good description of a craft brewery. Uh, if I think of a, a good craft brewery in my head, it probably ticks most of those boxes. The problem arises when you try to use this not as a not as a general description, but as a technical definition. If you try to say, right, we're going to measure each one of these attributes, and if a brewery doesn't meet each of these attributes, every one of these attributes, then it's no longer a craft brewery. And this is where problems immediately start to set in. So let's start with small brewery. Okay, then most of my famous, most of my favourite craft beer brands are no longer craft beers. Sierra Nevada is no longer a craft beer. Neither is Brooklyn. Neither is Duval. So, so we're saying here that if you're successful and people like your beer and you grow and you create more jobs and you sell your beer to more people, then you're not a craft brewer anymore. That, that seems problematic to my, to my mind. Traditional methods and ingredients. Um, well, that means that New England IPA is not a craft beer. That means that sour hibiscus gozers are not craft beers. It means that pastry stouts are not craft beers because they're not traditional. Uh, and they're not traditional ingredients. Uh, we're basically saying that uh, craft beer has to follow the Reinheitsgebot or it's not craft beer. And I think probably a, quite a large majority of craft brewers around the world would strongly object uh, to, to, to that uh, being a rule. Handcrafted. This means that as soon as you get a sparging arm or a paddle in a mash tun, uh, or you uh, get an automated mash tun cleaning system or anything, you get a computer, uh, computerized temperature control, you're no longer a craft brewer. So this means that you've got to spend your time uh, digging out your mash tun by hand, stirring it manually, otherwise you're not a craft brewer. What's the point in that? That doesn't work for, for, for brewers. Uncompromised. This might seem a bit of a more straightforward word, but compromise has different meanings. Um, a session IPA is a compromise. 
uh, because it's, it's a compromise between great hot flavour at high alcohol and a beer that is lower in alcohol that you can drink quite a lot of. So a session IPA is a compromise between two different uh, requirements in beer. Therefore, it's not craft beer under this definition. And perhaps the most absurd one is marketed locally. So this means that any craft beer from outside your, I mean, do you want to say 30 miles? Do you want to say 100 kilometers? But whatever, whatever distance you choose, any beer from outside that distance is no longer a craft beer. And this, mean, this is insane because this means that I can drink, if I drink a Dutch craft beer in Amsterdam, it's a craft beer. But if I buy it from a specialist bottle shop in London, it's not a craft beer anymore. And, and vice versa. If I, if I drink um, a, a London beer in London, it's a craft beer. But if you buy a, a, a bottle of it in Aaron's Nest in Amsterdam, then it's not a craft beer. So, so it, it just, it, the more terms we have, the more uh, chances there are for this definition to be problematic and to rule out a lot of breweries from, from being technically craft beer under such a definition, which is why this definition really took off, never really took off because craft brewers grew at a rate that was surely bigger than any one of them could have imagined. They became popular with a much bigger number of people across a much wider sphere of, of the world than probably they ever dreamed. So by 2005, when the American Brewers Association um, came up with their first attempt at defining what, what they saw as a craft beer for an industry standard for, for you know, to, to define membership of, of this club that they were effectively setting up. Um, they said it had to be small, independent and traditional. Now, small, they originally went with two million barrels because that was the level at which a tax break came in for small brewers. And if you grew beyond two million barrels, uh, you no longer qualified for that small brewer tax relief. Um, they changed that to six million barrels when uh, Sierra Nevada, sorry when, sorry, when Samuel Adams grew uh, bigger than two million barrels. Now this term is effectively meaningless because there, there are about seven or eight breweries in the US now uh, that brew more than six million barrels. So small covers 99.9% .9 of all breweries in the US. Uh, so why, why bother? They brought in independent, which was missing from Cotone's definition. I guess Vince Cotone would have assumed that craft brewers were always going to stay independently owned. He never foresaw a time when big brewers might start buying up these small artisanal producers. So independent, less than 25% owned or controlled by a beverage alcohol industry member that isn't a craft brewery, fine. And then traditional, uh, we've, we've still got this hangover from Cotone's definition that it has to be a traditional or innovative um, in fact, sorry, no, first it said traditional uh, brewing ingredients and fermentation. Now, for the reasons I mentioned, a lot of brewers found that problematic, so they quickly changed it to it has to be traditional or innovative. Now, what does that exclude? You're either traditional or you're new. I don't see any other category that ingredients could fall into. So that becomes effectively meaningless as well. So they uh, they went for this, uh, they'll go for this seal. You can see which bit is... Uh, coming through here as the most uh, important in this definition. And it's why by 2020, uh, the definition would become small, independent and brewer. So that independent thing is, so we've already established that small is effectively meaningless. You have to be a brewer, you have to brew beer, no shit, uh, if you wanna be a craft brewer. So independent is really the only meaningful definition uh, aspects that's left in this definition of craft beer. And this means that a beer like Youngling Light, uh, which is 175 years old, uh, a cheap copy of, of Budweiser, uh, using uh, adjuncts for not not for flavour reasons, but for kind of um, uh, you know for reasons of economy or, or ease of brewing, uh, is now a craft beer. It never was a craft beer until a couple of years ago. Now suddenly it is, and and this is the kind of beer that those craft brewers in in the 80s were were fighting against. This is the kind of beer that they wanted to replace. This is now a craft beer, whereas Goose Island Bourbon County Stout, is, Imperial Stout, is not a craft beer, despite the fact that it regularly tops poles of being one of the best Imperial barrel-aged stouts in the world. Um, so if Goose Island uh, Bourbon County Stout is not a craft beer because it's owned by AB InBev, and Youngling Light is a craft beer because it's independent, then whatever we're talking about here, we're not talking about craft beer anymore. We're not talking about craft in the way that Vince Catoni uh, defined it. And we're certainly not talking about craft in the way that I think most drinkers uh, relate to when they're thinking about what is a craft beer. So, so I think my, my contention here is that whatever words you try to put into this definition, you're always going to ex end up excluding and including the wrong kinds of people, which is why craft beer 
can't be defined in a way that would work for, okay, we're, we're a craft beer association. These are, these are criteria for membership. You, if you meet all these criteria, you're a member. If you don't, you're not. These, this is what's causing the problems around the world wherever people try to do this. So, so to try and get around this, at this point, what most, what, what most sane, reasonable people would do is they would say, okay, so let's, let's ditch the term craft beer in that case. Pete, you've made a very good argument as to why we should not be using the term craft beer anymore. And, and that's what most people would do, I think. And I didn't. What I did was I, I, I got obsessed with the word craft uh, because I felt that the word craft, despite all these problems, the word craft still has a lot to say and, and as it creates a very strong reaction uh, among drinkers. So I found this book by accident in my, in my local bookshop uh, with a, a curious spelling of craft. This is the old Anglo-Saxon early English spelling of craft from about a thousand years ago. Um, and I opened this book and on the first page of the book, uh, it was talking about how the rise of craft beer uh, showed that the, the concepts behind craft itself were more popular than they have been. And so I thought, this is gonna be great. This is gonna tell me all about craft beer, not from a beer perspective, but from a craft perspective. The guy then never mentions beer again anywhere through the book, which really pissed me off at first. But then I found that when I read the book, I realized that I could take these ideas and link them to, to beer myself. Um, and at first it was quite discouraging because one of the first things he says is that uh, craft has become so ubiquitous, it's increasingly difficult to state with any exactitude, a definition precise enough to satisfy everyone. This is exactly what I've just said about craft beer. He's saying, forget that, you can't even define the word craft. So if we can't define the word craft, how the hell can we expect to define the word craft beer? But as you might imagine, lots of people have had a good go at defining the word craft. And it's a word that has a very long and interesting history. Um, and now my slide was, won't move on for some reason. Um, in the UK, in, in England, craft uh, goes back to Alfred the Great uh, in the 10th and 11th century. Um, and, and what's interesting about this, when I mentioned Michael Jackson and the difference between the French word artisanal and the English word craft, is that artisanal obviously means doing something by hand. It's very much exclusively tied up with the physical aspect of, of craft, of knowing how to do something. Alfred the Great was trans translating a lot of Latin documents into English for the first time. And he, he, he annotated these documents with his own thoughts in the margins. And he used the word craft pretty much more than any other word. And he used it across a wide number of subjects, he talked about a combination of knowledge, power, and skill. And, and what was interesting for him was that the, the, the mental idea of knowledge and skill was, if, was if, if anything, that was more important than the physical artisanal uh, side of, of things. Wisdom and resourcefulness were, were the key aspects to it. And in, in English, we use the word craft with a lot of things that are mental concepts uh, or, or intellectual concepts rather than physical. So we talk about statecraft or spycraft or, or even witchcraft as, as, as ideas about knowledge that, with, with the, that knowledge as craft. Um, the, the key thing about it, though, is it's a superior level of skill gained over time. Uh, and I've read a lot of books about craft now. I've read books written by uh, furniture makers, by sociologists, uh, by motorcycle um, repairers, and, and they all have this similar fascination with this idea of craft. And they all agree on the fact that it's about learning a skill, uh, taking time in order to be competent, let alone a master practitioner. Tutoring begins with an apprenticeship. And I thought this was a very interesting thing when I thought back to beer because I could go out tomorrow, buy a, a, a 10 barrel brew kit, uh, do a couple of home brews and call myself a craft brewer. And no one would say that I wasn't. Um, in a lot of craft, you have to have this idea of tutoring, apprenticeship, time spent learning skill. And I don't think we, I think looking at craft shows that we don't perhaps spend enough time thinking about that aspect uh, within the craft beer world. Uh, and there's this idea here, I'll, I'll explain this because it's a kind of subtle thing in the English language, but the idea of knowledge versus know-how. Um, know-how is knowing, obviously knowing how to do something, whereas knowledge is this intellectual concept. And this is where we, we start to see that they're two different things. Um, this is a great book written about 100 years ago uh, by a guy called George Sturt. And his family made uh, wooden, uh, big wooden wheels for carts for use by farmers. And uh, Sturt wanted to get out of the family business. Uh, he went to school, he went to university, and his idea was to be a teacher and a writer. And then his father died and he had to go back into the family business making wooden wheels. And, and he went into that business, he writes about this in the book, and he says, well, I'm an intellectual, I know all sorts of stuff. The guys who work in this wheelwright shop are uneducated, uh, they don't have any education, they can't read or write, 
uh, obviously I can easily learn all their skills uh, because they, these guys are stupid and I'm clever. And he very quickly came unstuck and he is very honest about this, that because he was intellectual, he felt he could learn everything that he needed to know. And he quickly realized that he couldn't, that, that this was all about skills that were learned over time, learned by hand, uh, and, and that they became so innate, they became so ingrained that uh, people struggle to even talk about them or describe them anymore. And I think a good analogy from our lives today is if you think about tying your shoelaces and learning to do that when you were a child and how long it took to tie your shoelaces to learn how to do it properly. And now when you do it, you don't even think about it. It doesn't cross your mind what you're doing. Your hands have learned uh, the, the movement so well that you don't even have to engage your brain in order to do it. And a lot of craft is bound up in this skill. It's this idea that the, the, the division between physical skill and mental skill is actually artificial. The craft is about the unification of both intellectual and physical. And I, I, I've, when I've done this presentation before, I, I've put a, a piece of video in here and I got into trouble for the video because it breached UEFA copyright rules. Um, that there's no reason why you'd remember England's performance in the uh, 1996 European Championships as well as I do. But this was one of the best goals I ever saw scored. Um, Paul Gascoigne was running forward. The ball came to him. With one touch, he looped the ball over the last remaining defender's head, ran around the defender, and then with his other foot, just rifled it into the net. It's one of the most amazing pieces of football skill I've ever seen. And uh, when it comes up on British compilation programmes about the greatest sporting moments of all time and that kind of thing. And Gascoigne, when he was interviewed afterwards, said, you can't teach kids that. It was pure instinct. Gascoigne had a reputation in this country for being quite stupid. And so it was It was quite interesting that he got this kind of, that he was such an amazingly skilled footballer. And I, I don't think you can be that skillful if you are genuinely stupid. Gascoigne's thing, he had to know about the likely reactions of the defender, the guy he was playing against, but he also had to understand the physics of a ball in space and the application of uh, force onto a ball in space and the angle and direction and velocity that that ball was going to go at based on his kick. That's Gascoigne could never tell you that, but that's knowledge that he has innately in his body, and that's what, what makes him a craftsman. Uh, these ideas culminated to some extent in the, uh, the arts and crafts movement of the 1880s through to about the 1920s. Uh, this is a guy called William Morris who was born about three, four hundred years too late. Um, and he was very, uh, he was a socialist, uh, he was progressive, he was very left wing. And one of the things he was most angry about was that work had become dehumanized. Industrial production had taken the dignity uh, and, and satisfaction away from workers. If you were a shoemaker uh, in, in centuries past and you made a shoe, you were making every part of the shoe. And, and if you made better shoes, you had a, a better reputation than the shoemaker in the next town. Uh, what industrialization did is put everybody in a production line. One guy nails in one nail holding the heel on, the next guy nails in the next nail, and so on. So no, no person involved in the production has any autonomy. Uh, they don't develop any meaningful skills. And every shoe that comes off the end of the production line looks the same. Uh, and they, they have no, there's no mark of the creator on it. It doesn't matter who's made it. They're, they're just almost machine made. People have become part of a machine rather than having any individual uh, artistry or craftsmanship. And so what, what, what uh, William Morris did was create workshops where tasks were reunified, where craftsmen could learn their skills, craftspeople could learn their skills and, and have some dignity and, and some satisfaction and some job satisfaction at the end of the process. Uh, and this was an idea that took off and, and really caught people's imaginations, but then ultimately failed because the whole point of industrial production is that it's cheap um, and everyone can afford it. And of course, the only people who could afford crafts, you know, because crafts people had to be paid a fair wage for their craft, their products were more expensive. And I think you can start to see some parallels developing between this and modern craft beer. Uh, but what comes out consistently in all this discussion, all the history of craft is it does mean handmade. It means working with your hands. Uh, I like to think of a traditional cooper making barrels as the, as the ultimate example of what craft means today in the beer industry. Um, uh, but essentially, it's all about the maker. This idea of uh, Morris recombining skills, it's about the dignity of the maker. It's about, it's about the job satisfaction of the person making the stuff. It's not necessarily about the consumer. It's not thinking about the end product or the person who's going to be using it. Um, I've put this picture up because uh, we have different eras where craft comes back. The, the idea of craft in William Morris terms comes back and is more interesting again to people. 
We saw it in the 1970s when work was really industrialized and automated, and we're seeing it now. And when I go to food festivals, the guy who te who's teaching people how to carve a wooden spoon is often uh, the most popular guy at a food festival. There are best-selling books in the UK about carving wooden spoons. Now you can buy a wooden spoon for, for pennies, so why would you bother making one? Well, it's because it's about, it's not about the spoon. It's not about what you're going to use a spoon for. It's about the satisfaction of making it, just like Morris said. Uh, and this is another interesting example of, of this phenomenon. Uh, this is a guy, he's a French documentary filmmaker who a few years ago made a sandwich. And that's the ingredients for the sandwich on the right. And that's him holding his sandwich on the left. When I say he made the sandwich, it took him 10 months. He planted the wheat to grow the, the grains to make the bread. Uh, he planted the vegetables and, and he, uh, he, he went sea fishing to catch tuna. Uh, so he did the whole thing himself. And when he was interviewed about why he'd done it, he said, I believe that my generation doesn't have enough to do with its hands. And, and that's why I did it. And this is actually, Can I interrupt this is actually what I'm into us. We have, some questions so from, we have some questions from the audience. Can I please interrupt you for a short time? Yes, sure. All right. Yep. Um, someone's wondering how can we uh, uh, discuss about automatic brewing and craft if we measure almost everything by computers and uh, instruments? And another person asks the question, how many breweries still put in the grains by hand? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is a... Uh, th th there's a this is addressed in the broader craft debate because there's a there's a parallel uh, with with artists using 3D printing to create art objects, uh, and the similar question there is if if they're if they're drawing something on a computer screen uh, and creating an art object uh, using 3D printing, can they still be said to be the craftsman who built that object? Because kind of they weren't, and it's a question that I do address in the book in some detail towards the end. Um, and I, I, I think I, it's an argument. Uh, that's the, the title of my book. Uh, so it's, it's all about having a position on that argument. And I, and I think my, my side on the argument would be that if you move towards automation and you uh, are using machines and you're not doing things by hand, then you still can be craft. It's, it's, it's about your motivation for doing it. If you're not going to be doing it by hand, why are you doing it? And if you're still doing it for other reasons, which are kind of tied up in what craft is all about, then I think it's fine, but it is problematic. One of the things I'm doing here is to say, kind of say how absurd it is that we can't define craft because as soon as it's not handmade, then it's not craft. That's not useful to anyone if we stick to that position as a, as a hard line thing. So we have to think around that and say, you know, the concept of craft in this way was developed 150 50 years ago. Is it any longer useful for the way we're talking about craft now? So so I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that at the end. All right, thank you. Um, so, but just before I leave the thing about being made by hand, uh, this is a, the cortical homunculus. It was a, a project done by a, a neuroscientist in the 1950s who uh, he looked at how much of the cerebral cortex in the brain is devoted to analyzing and um, processing sensations from different parts of the body. And he redrew the human body. This is the human body reimagined if the amount of our brain that is spent thinking about it was was proportionate to the size of the limbs. So we can see that the hands are nearly half the size of the body. That's because nearly half the cerebral cortex is devoted to sensations from the hands. So if we're not doing anything with our hands apart from tapping buttons or swiping screens, it's a form of sensory deprivation. And this is why, as we are now so screen-based, so many people are, are looking to do things by hand. And this is what's driving a, a resurgence in the idea of craft. For me, it's making sourdough bread. I can buy sourdough bread from a shop close to me cheaper than I can buy the flour to make it. But it's about the satisfaction of the feeling of the dough in my hands when I'm baking. Uh, Hobbycraft is now a global chain uh, of arts and crafts uh, making things. Uh, its profits grew 200% in lockdown as people kind of doing embroidery, macrame, stitching, upcycling furniture. We all have our different things that we that we want to kind of make by hand. And if we can't make them by hand, then we want to buy them from people who have made them by hand. But in all this discussion of craft, talking about skill, knowledge, apprenticeship, um, uh, being being made by hand, all these kind of things, the one attribute that these other people talking about craft outside beer never mention is independence. It doesn't even get talked about in relation to craft anywhere else apart from in beer. And I think there's a reason for that, which is that craftspeople always had, because someone's got, to, someone's got to pay these guys to kind of sit in the beautiful workshop and make a chair from scratch or make a pair of shoes from scratch, 
someone's got to pay for that. And so craftspeople always had wealthy patrons. Uh, the church used to commission craftsmen to do sculptures and paintings. After the church, it was nobility. In William Morris's day, the only people who bought the beautiful products from his workshops were the industrialists who owned the factories who were employing people to make things on production lines. Being able to afford a crafted product was a sign of affluence. It was a sign of richness. Uh, and there was always an assumption that somebody rich was paying craftspeople to do this for them. So, so when we're talking about independence now within craft beer, we're not talking about something that comes up very often uh, in definition of craft, or at all in definitions of craft outside beer. And, and yet this is the way that the industry has moved. Uh, all around the world, craft beer associations, small brewers associations, are rebadging themselves as independent rather than craft. And I can see why that is. But I also think it's problematic. Um, the, the question being, it's more ownable. You can say, yes, all those problems I talked about earlier, right? well, it, as soon as you say this, you're excluding people. Independent is great because we want to exclude the big guys, don't we? Uh, and, and keep the little guys in. So, so we can own independence and define it really, really sharply. But is it as relevant to the consumer? This is the problem. Um, because uh, there's some recent stats from the UK. Most people drink across the broad. I'm going to speed up a little bit because I'm aware I'm using the time. Um, most people who, who drink beer drink across an increasingly wide repertoire of drinks. Uh, the average beer drinker used to flirt between bottled lager and cask ale and all these kind of things. They're now going across pink gin, uh, cocktails, uh, coffee martinis, all this kind of thing. So if people are drinking the same or a little bit less overall and they're spreading their, their consumption across a broader number of drinks, then they're drinking more different things, but everything's getting a lower share. So more people are drinking less craft beer. And what this means is that in the UK now, 59% of people say they understand what craft beer is and that they drink it. Now, this is, this, is, this is no longer that small, hardcore group of craft enthusiasts who really care about all the concepts behind it. These are people who see craft beer on the bar, and if it's got a good label, they're going to buy it. Uh, but if they don't see one, they're going to buy a, a gin and tonic or, or something else. So when we talk to people about independence, this can be problematic. And, and this is where I go back to my marketing career and talk about the difference between selling and marketing. When you're selling a product, you, you create the product and then you tell people that you've made it, you tell them what its features are, and you hope that they buy it. Marketing, when it's done well, and boy, is it not done well <laughs> at the moment. But what you should do is start with a consumer need and then make a product according to that consumer need, uh, which is a different way around of, of doing things. And I think when we talk about independence within brewing at the moment, we're selling it rather than marketing it. Uh, and this reminds me of the classic selling thing is, is, um, is, is uh, Ford and the Ford Model T, uh, where Ford said they can have it in any color they want so long as it's black. That's completely ignoring uh, any kind of consumer motivations. Uh, and it's just saying, we're selling, this is what we make, either buy it or don't buy it. And of course, the Model T was very famous, but there's no one in car production today saying, well, you can have it in any color you like so long as it's black. Marketing works a different way. So the best, the best uh, description I've ever heard of this was no one really wants to buy a quarter-inch drill. Uh, why, why would you want a quarter-inch drill? drill? Well, you want a quarter-inch drill to make a quarter-inch hole. You want to buy the best means possible of making that hole, not the drill. And at the moment, for most people, the drill happens to be the best way of making the hole. If there was like a, a laser that could make it more easily or cheaply, no one would buy drills anymore. So you have to, so drill makers have to kind of bear that in mind. And businesses disappear because they don't think in these terms. It's called marketing myopia, where you think about your product first and the consumer second. And marketing ideally is about thinking about the consumer first and your product second based on their, on their terms, which is why some of the successful things, going back to cars, um, selling cars to people would have involved explaining what an internal combustion engine is uh, to people who'd never heard of one and didn't know the technology. What they did instead to get people to buy cars was call it a horseless carriage. People knew what a carriage was, so a carriage that didn't require a horse, yes, I get that, how does that work? Well, it's got an engine, okay, I've got you. So that, that's an example of what marketing is as, as opposed to selling. Um, and, and I think this is relevant to craft beer because if you've got, if I, I mentioned that hardcore, you've got a bunch of people who buy craft beer mainly because they want to support independent breweries and they want to take a stance against, um, against corporate breweries. That's fantastic. I'm one of those people uh, and, and long may it continue. But if you want to grow and reach this broader craft curious audience, they're already buying beers that don't come from independent brewers. They may think that independence is quite nice, but not the biggest uh, factor in choosing a brand. 
So for people like this, if you want to engage them, you need to make them care about what independence means to them. You need to market independence to them rather than just selling it. Um, and so we're faced with a, a quandary, which is, can you make independent meaningful to people who are perfectly happy currently buying macro beer? Or do you retain craft, which is much, much harder to define, um, and be happy to be share it with people who maybe you think shouldn't be using the term? And I think it's a question of doing both. I think we have to sell independence, well, sort of market independence, make that mean something, but also be happy to keep craft because it's a deeper, more meaningful concept. Um, so I offer, uh, to conclude, I, I get to a place where I've got four aspects, which I don't call a definition of craft beer uh, for a reason which I'll, I'll bring up. I think it's about skill and creativity. This is what consumers assume is, all, is what craft is all about. They assume that craft brewers are more skillful and creative than mainstream brewers. Often this is not the case. And this is a standard that craft brewers should, if you want to call yourself a craft brewer, really use uh, and, and hold on to. It should be quality beer. People assume that you're going to create a better quality product. Again, this is not always the case. Uh, autonomy, I think, is quite important. What I mean by this is, irrespective of, of who owns the brewery, uh, whether it's a large corporation or independently owned, does the brewer have uh, the, what, the, the William Morris idea? Do they, do they have this kind of autonomy over what they make? Can the brewer go into work on a Monday morning and say, you know what, we've not made an imperial stout for a while. Uh, I think I'd like to make an imperial stout today. My argument is that if a brewer can do that, then it's a craft brewery. If he can't, then, it, then it's not. And motivation, why are people doing this? Are you, are you making your hazy New England IPA because you think it's gonna sell loads and loads of units uh, because it's really popular right now? Or are you making a New England IPA because you're fascinated by the style, uh, you love the flavor, you love the interplay of the ingredients, and you want to make the best New England IPA that you can? And I, I, th I think that's a rhetorical question. But the, these are standards that I think could be held up to any company, uh, independently owned or corporately owned, and say, if you, if you can prove these things, then you're a craft brewer. If you, if you cannot, then you're not a craft brewer. And the big problem in doing that is that none of these things can be measured. Um, I mean, perhaps quality can be measured by standards and training and things like that. But how do you measure someone's motivation? I, I think it's very problematic, which is why I say it's, it's a non-definition of craft beer. It's just something to aspire to. And going back to the, 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 one of the questions where it mentioned the, um, the, the, the measuring of everything, uh, this is absolutely key because th this is what, this is what um, Taylor Scientific Management was the ultimate expression of measuring, breaking down and measuring every single aspect of production so that it could be perfected. And, and the problem with that is that that's everything that craft beer is not. The whole idea of craft is it's the, it's the intangible thing that can't be measured, something that can't even be uh, articulated sometimes. It's that skill, the skill of tying your shoelaces, that you can't even say, well, this is, this is how you do it, like riding a bicycle or, or something else. And whenever we look at great craft, what, what separates the craftsperson from someone who's merely competent is this indefinable specialness. If you think about your favourite craft beer, you know the ingredients that go into it, you know the brewing process, but there's something in that beer that isn't in other beers like it and that's what craft is and i'll just finish now by saying um so i i think i've got to a point where i love the word craft i love the idea of craft but it's deeply imperfect and if i was an academic uh, talking about this i would i would employ uh, martin heidegger's concept of surature which means under erasure uh, what he means by this is since the word is inaccurate it is, it is crossed out since it is necessary it remains legible uh, and so if I was going to be really pedantic and really wanted to annoy people, I would say we should keep the term craft beer, but always write a line through it. I'm not really going to suggest that, but that's where this kind of, that's where this kind of debate does lead you to eventually. So thank you for listening. Uh, and if we have time, I'd be very happy to take some more questions. All right, Pete, thank you very much for this interesting vision and uh, on our craft uh, as a definition, I guess. Uh, when I think back of craft, I always think back on my grandfather, who was a master shoes maker. That was a craftsman, a real craftsman. Yeah, he can make uh, a part of shoe, a set of shoes from a cow, by instance. But we have some questions from our audience. Uh, first of all, we have Richard Rusby. He says, "I'm curious what you think of craft beer, not specially, uh, uh, not specifically as a definition of what something is, but what it is not, given the origin of craft beer as a counter movement to big beer. Viewed in that lens, the definition of craft matters hugely from a marketing perspective." or what is it perceived as. Perception of craft in modern marketing always has customers seeing quality in craft. Yeah, there's, there's a lot to unpack in that. Yeah. Uh, I, I totally agree with the idea that perception of craft in modern marketing 
people do think it's about quality. And I, and I don't think that's something that the craft beer industry talks about or, or measures or prioritises. So I think there is a gap between what the industry talks about as craft and, and what the consumer expects from craft. Um, I, I think it's useful to think about this question from, a con, from, a, from the definition of the, of the consumer, for the person that you are hoping will buy your beer. And yeah, they, every single piece of research I've seen on this shows that people expect uh, it to be small, to be, to be local, to be um, uh, to be good quality, uh, to be created, to be not to be different, to be not just a commercial, familiar commercial bland bland lager. Um, but what's interesting in these definitions, when when you ask consumers, is you know you might get you might get um, small or local as by far the biggest answers that people give. But they're still only getting forty percent uh, or thirty five percent of of the total sample of people who've been asked. So it's not like it's not like when you ask people. 98% of people say that it's about quality or 98% of people say it's about local. There's lots and lots of different aspects that go into it. And people out there feel happy uh, with this idea of the, the definition being amorphous, uh, changing, uh, not quite precise. And, and as I, I argue, that's exactly what craft is. Every, every time craft comes up, it's, it's about being imprecise. It's about being unmeasurable. I feel like I'm dodging the question there, but I, I do feel that we should ask consumers what, what they think. All right, uh, still room for two more short questions. Uh, other than the great public, is there another authority to judge what it is, what it's not? A craft product? So should it be independently judged? Hmm. Yeah, me. <laughs> no, I, uh, uh, I, um, I, I, don't think there, I don't think there is. Um, the, the, the issue we've seen is that, um, I, th I think this is a problem with the American Brewers Association, because to, to be perfectly clear, they never set out to offer a definition of craft beer um, that should be useful around the world. They just want to set the criteria for membership to their club, to the American Brewers Association. But even though they're not, so so we, in a way we can't criticize them for what's happened to their definition. But but people around the world are looking for this definition. So they, they hit on the uh, American Brewers Association definition and try to use that. And it's not applicable outside America. If, 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 my argument is it doesn't even work in America, but it certainly doesn't work outside America. And then you start to try and quantify it and put it in different ways. Uh, and and our, our, our the sticking point on all this is that we're so desperate for a definition uh, we, we, we can't look beyond that. And my argument, I guess, is that we should stop trying to nail this precise definition and just be happy that the idea is uh, more fluid than that. Okay, thank you. Last question by Ferry. He asks himself, should Craft, our uh, branch uh, uh, organization, make an independent label for Dutch craft beer? Short answer, yes I, or no? Yes. <laughs> I, th I, think, I think you're going to anyway. Um, so, so my, my advice would just be to, to think about what that means to people and make it meaningful to people, rather than just put it on the bottle and go, yeah, we've done our job. Yeah, all right. Again, um, thanks very, very much for this uh, interesting insight on the uh, definition of craft throughout the ages, I guess. Um, for our audience, we have a short sponsor video and then we will be back.